Hello, and thank you for joining us for a virtual rendition of ASCO Voices. I'm Dr. Tatiana Prell from the US Food and Drug Administration and the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. I'm delighted to be the chair of this year's ASCO Voices session. For those unfamiliar with the session, ASCO Voices is a special session that features personal narratives and perspectives to expand your views of oncology, medicine, and the world. There are no slides or data in these talks, just a story and a virtual stage. The five presentations that you'll hear today were selected after an open audition process last fall. They'll feature topics ranging from loss in medicine to partnership with patients, mental health for physicians, the importance of a growth mindset in science and medicine, and the unique challenges of being a Black woman in medicine. We hope that you'll enjoy the session. To begin our session, I would like to introduce Dr. Aparna Parikh. Dr. Parikh is a GI oncologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital who specializes in colorectal and pancreatic cancer. She has a large portfolio of therapeutic trials and expertise in liquid biopsies of GI cancers. Aside from her clinical and translational role, she has a long-standing history and background in global health equity. She co-founded and co-leads a program called Poetic, which prior to the COVID-19 pandemic brought eight to 10 oncologists from Sub-Saharan Africa to Boston for an enhanced training program to support clinical development and provide research mentorship. She also runs the GI Oncology Education Series for the MGH Oncology Fellows. She is delighted to share the story of her dear friend and colleague, Rachel. Dr. Parikh's talk is entitled, Ode to Rachel. day to you all. This is certainly an odd venue to be sharing the story that I'll be sharing with you today, but I'm truly honored to share one particular story with you. And at the end, you'll understand the significance of me wearing red today, and particularly this t-shirt, which says today was a good day, and a shirt I intentionally chose to wear while sharing the story. In this forum, all of us have been touched by cancer professionally, and most of us have likely been personally affected by cancer as well, including me. There was my uncle who I was with at the time of passing, a high powered late 40s dad of two Indian executive with access to PD-1 therapy well beyond when it was available in India, but without access to pain medications, who silently suffered during his fight with terminal gastric cancer. And my 32 year old cousin, a mother and a wife who succumbed to ovarian cancer after a long and painful battle with the disease. And I saw, again, at the bedside, the challenges a family faces while caring for a loved one while on home hospice and the burden of responsibility that falls on the family. Then there's a dear friend and a fellow oncologist who has adapted to vision loss from a CNS tumor, remaining steadfast in her struggle with the CNS disease, but continuing her powerhouse work and trailblazing in oncology. We all too now have our COVID stories that have deeply shaped us. I think of each of these powerful examples, and then I think about one, a story about Rachel Perline, and this is my ode to her. Rachel was the embodiment of strength and grace that all these patients have taught me. I tell her stories of testament to all the people we have known with any form of terminal illness, not only to honor her memory, but to give us all a chance to see the light in what seems hopeless. Rachel and I were meant to be friends. During a brief call just before fellowship began, for her, um, I was already in fellowship, we realized all the strange interconnectedness of our circles. We had so many um, ties that we couldn't believe it. We became fast and close friends. And when she moved to San Francisco, we bonded over our love of travel, our socialness, our poor driving skills, rapidity of speech, our love of the water, our sweet tooth and global oncology. She was full of life and had traveled the world collecting friends wherever she went and had the best stories. Some of those stories included befriending a certain Canadian prime minister. She was an early responder at Ground Zero and she worked in the Superdome during Hurricane Katrina. However, she wanted nothing more than to become an oncologist, particularly after losing her mom to breast cancer too young. Months into her fellowship on a ride home from the VA, I often gave her rides home because she didn't like to drive. She complained to me of vague epigastric discomfort and weight loss. It was all just stress, right? 
I then began to worry when she said even desserts really weren't tasting good anymore. Rachel's cancer story began, gastric cancer story began after an endoscopy. She opted for no sedation actually during this procedure because she was on call and she kept her pager on with her the whole time. As Rachel described, her life had become a bad after school movie. The budding GI oncologist who gets a terminal gastric cancer herself. Rachel was beloved from the moment she arrived at UCSF. She had an ever present smile, an extraordinary dedication and an unbridled enthusiasm. Remarkably, she remained a fellow during treatment and she invited us all in, providing insight into cancer care through the lens of a patient and physician. Rachel, the oncologist, taught us about handling phone calls in the middle of the night with kindness and empathy. Rachel, the oncologist, showed us the agony of waiting for CT scans and her patients never had to wait for results. Rachel, the oncologist, consoled and counseled a terrified Mandarin-speaking patient and went well and beyond finding another Mandarin-speaking patient as well as a video to convince the patient to undergo a life-saving surgery in such that um, showing her that an ostomy wouldn't be so bad. This was all in Mandarin. Rachel, the oncologist, saw patients while getting chemotherapy herself with her full box pump in hand. Rachel, the oncologist, during her own admissions, had her famous red slippers in tow but was plugged in to what was happening for her patients. She prepped clinic notes from her own hospital bed and she advocated for early discharge so she didn't have to miss too much clinic. Rachel, the oncologist, frightened the infusion center with her infectious smile and she always brought baked, baked goods, often made with her sister, Sarah. Rachel, the oncologist, became the go-to confidant for the young adult support group at UCSF. We started a tradition of chemo parties after chemo. Um, it started after the first one with me and my husband, and we had the privilege of sharing 17 of these, including one that was on video while I was on labor and delivery with my first child. These chemo parties were often with people Rachel adored most. Friends would fly into town. Often her dad or sister would be in town as well. It became our tradition. She always talked about how grateful she was to receive such VIP care during her journey and she wished that her parent patients could get the VIP care that she did. But the truth is, they did get VIP care because they had her, and as friends, we had her too. At the end of the day with Rachel, we all had to go around the room and share why the day was good, and there was always a reason. This is a ritual that's still part of my bedtime routine with my own kids, and is a powerful practice of gratitude, and she taught us all. When she decided she wanted to go home on hospice after a devastating aborted surgery, realizing that she was exhausted from treatment and anxious just to be at home with her family, we rallied. In her day, her loved ones raised $30,000 to get her on a medical flight home. A medical flight was needed because she had an NG tube in. When she got home, she made a goodbye video, which I encourage everyone to watch and I'll post today. And in this video, she reminded us to think of her in the red of fall, her favorite color. Go to a pool and kick hard. Go somewhere you've never been, use a paper map, twist open and devour Oreos. Try some new food, but take a picture first. And lastly, smile. She said once towards the end of her cancer journey that she so wished she could have had the chance to graduate and to be an oncologist and be on the ASCO podium one day. We were able to do a virtual graduation while she was home in the hospice, awarding her the diploma she so deserved. And though it's not the same, I wanted Rachel the oncologist to have a chance on this virtual podium today. Rachel may not be standing on the ASCO stage, but her bright light shines here to impact each and every one of you. And I wanted to share her story to give you a glimpse into her beautiful life in hopes that though she may not be directly caring for patients, her bright light does impact each and every one of you. Because of her, I'm undoubtedly a better person and a better oncologist. My patients and patients of so many of her colleagues will benefit because of her. She was the truest of healers. She was a rare gem and just a special soul. Dr. Allen Benuck, her oncologist extraordinaire, and both of our mentors, always says, never stop learning. And the lesson here was not just about medicine, but about friendship and about living. Though we have no explanation at all for why this disease chose her and ultimately took her, she taught, loved, and inspired in such profound ways. I am so grateful to her family, her dad, Don, sister and brother-in-law, Sarah and Brian, and stepmom, Sharon Gay, for their friendships and continued friendships to this day, and also for letting us share a piece of their ritual with me and my family. I'm so grateful to Rachel for helping us find the good in every day.
and I will always finish every day with why today was a good day because that's just what you did with Rachel. Thank you, Rachel, for your bright light and your life's work. And even in these unsettling and troubling times today, I hope each of you listening will find your good day. And remember, Rachel, when those leaves start to turn red in fall. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Dr. Jose Bufill and Ms. Alice Cusa. Dr. Bufill is a hematologist oncologist in full-time clinical practice in Northern Indiana for over 25 years. He has participated in numerous educational initiatives in oncology, cancer genetics, and bioethics for pre-medical and medical students, and served for 10 years as the Director of Medical Education at St. Joseph Regional Medical in South Bend, Indiana. Ms. Alice Cusa was born and raised in Rwanda. She studied in Odessa, Ukraine, and has a master's degree in economics. Ms. Cusa immigrated to the U.S. in 2001, and for the past two decades has worked as a budget grants account manager. Ms. Cusa is also a cancer survivor. In the spring of 2017, she was diagnosed with acute promyelocytic leukemia, along with seven of her college classmates, almost 30 years after having been exposed to the fallout from the Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986. She underwent successful cancer treatment under the care of Dr. Bufill and has subsequently been in remission. Ms. Cusa is a passionate community activist involved in the Rwandan Diaspora Community Associations, which encourage Rwandans living abroad to contribute to their home country's economic development. It is in that spirit the Ms. Cusa and Dr. Bufill founded a nonprofit organization, the Comera Rwanda Cancer Foundation, aimed at improving cancer care and programming in Rwanda. Their presentation is entitled, Stay Strong Rwanda, Cancer Can Be Cured. Hello, my name is Joe Bufill. I'm a medical oncologist practicing in Northwest Indiana. I'm here with my friend and cancer survivor, Alice Tiusa. Hello, Asko. I'm Alice, and we would like to tell you about our projects to help cancer patients in my native country of Rwanda. Our story begins in 2017 when Alice was hospitalized with weakness, anemia, and extensive bruising. From her social history, I learned that after graduating from high school in Kigali, she obtained a scholarship to study in the Ukraine and went on to complete a master's degree in economics from the University of Odessa. While studying there, she and her classmates were exposed to fallout from the Chernobyl nuclear accident. I lived in Odessa from 1989 to 1994 arriving three years after the first explosion that made headlines around the world. Soon after we settled into school and without much explanation, the Ukrainian authorities told us to stay indoors with doors and windows closed. We were given iodine pills to take. We were college kids and didn't pay too much attention, even though we saw people walking around dressed like cosmonauts and saw airplanes spraying green powder over the city. We eventually learned that there was radiation coming from uh, Chernobyl. So 30 years later, Alice was diagnosed with an acute promyelocytic leukemia. She had already learned that several of her classmates from Odessa had been diagnosed with leukemia and none had survived. When I first learned I had leukemia, I couldn't believe it. I was convinced my life was over. My first thought was that I had to put on a brave face when I spoke to my kids to prepare them for my death. For Rwandans, the experience of cancer and its treatment is usually very negative. Friends and family with cancer back home do not do well. Cancers are usually found in advanced stages, treatments are very expensive, and sometimes the quality of the medication is not so good. All the complicated support system we use to treat cancer patients in the U.S. do not exist in Rwanda. For most people in Africa, cancer means death. So Alice was definitely skeptical 
when I told her that her leukemia could be treated successfully. After a long course of atra and arsenic, she entered a complete remission. That alone would be a great story, but the real adventure begins after that. After completing the treatments, I began to feel better and began to think that maybe I wasn't going to die after all. It was like the end of a roller coaster ride. While the ride is going on, you feel completely helpless. Everything is happening too fast, and there are times when you feel very close to death. And then the ride ends. You come back to Earth after a big rush of emotion, step out of the little car, and have to begin life all over again. During her treatments, I learned a few more things about Rwanda and about Alice. She had emigrated to the U.S. in 2000, ended up in South Bend, and for a time after her arrival, lived in a local homeless shelter with her four children. I also learned that Alice is an entrepreneur at heart. She quickly got acquainted with her new environment, leveraged her education, and got a job at the University of Notre Dame helping to manage research grants for the School of Engineering. She also became a leader in the local Rwandan community, organizing cultural events for young people so they wouldn't forget their heritage, and networking with Rwandan friends back home and abroad to help their local economies. I have to say that the experience of cancer, the consideration of me really dying, and then having life given back to me was a moment of awakening. I felt that I needed to take advantage of my experience to help others back home, to give them hope that cancer could be treated and cured. I wasn't sure where to start, so I started with the only cancer doctor I knew at the time. I invited Dr. Bofell to visit Rwanda and arranged for him to meet with doctors there. Our first visit to Rwanda was a moment of awakening for me as well. I discovered a very great unmet need, a great willingness to address that need, and few resources to do so. One moment of inspiration came as we were traveling down a rural road in a car. Without signage anywhere, our driver seemed to have lost his way. Coming toward us on the road was a boy, maybe 12 or 13 years old, carrying a bundle of sticks. He was barefoot and dressed in rags. He also carried himself with the confidence of a natural leader. Our driver called him over and asked him for directions in the local language. After checking out the passengers, he gave the driver instructions, and as he began to move on with his sticks, he said with a big smile, Komeda Muzungu, Komeda. Everyone in the car except me began to laugh out loud, and when they recovered, they told me what he had said. Komeda Muzungu means basically, hang in there, white man, stay strong. That was a great moment. We immediately knew what we had to do. We would start an initiative to promote cancer care and education in Rwanda, and we call it Comera. We are starting very small. We have established the Comera Rwanda Cancer Care Foundation as a U.S. nonprofit. We are planning another trip to Rwanda with U.S. trained Rwandan oncology nurses. We hope to be the catalyst to improve access to care, public education, and professional training in oncology in Rwanda. And once we succeed, who knows where we could end up? Comera is just the beginning of a new roller coaster ride. ASCO and other important organizations are already working hard to address the many and varied needs of African cancer patients. We believe that small grassroots initiatives like Comera can also make valuable contributions to cancer patient care through friendship with Rwandan doctors and nurses and by inspiring creative collaborative business models. Let's hope that we can stay strong and find our path on behalf of cancer patients in Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Julia Close. Dr. Close is a medical oncologist at the University of Florida. 
She has held several leadership roles, including Assistant Chief of Medicine at the Malcolm Randall VA Medical Center, Director of the University of Florida Hematology and Oncology Fellowship Training Program, and Chair of the Veterans Health Administration Field Advisory Committee for Oncology. She currently serves as an Associate Professor and the Associate Dean of Gradu Graduate Medical Education at the University of Florida. Her primary focus is on medical education and her clinical focus is on the care of people with sarcoma. Dr. Close will be speaking on the topic, how are you? I was meeting with a colleague early on a Monday morning. I asked him, how are you? I was surprised when he, a man working in another division and several years my senior, replied, I'm not so good. I enrolled my mom in hospice this weekend. We spent the next few minutes talking about the inevitable passage of time that leads us to lose so many we love, and then we moved on to our meeting. I'm not sure why he opened up to me that day. We don't share a social circle. Perhaps it's the same force that leads strangers on planes to share with us, as oncologists, the stories of loved ones lost to cancer. Perhaps he just needed to acknowledge the weight of his heart. Whatever the reason, this conversation is etched in my mind. Normally when I ask someone, how are you? They say fine. I often do the same. It's a little white lie repeated over and over again. Before my third child was born, Rather than excitedly expecting his birth, I found myself frequently tearful with a sense of doom that I could not place. As an oncologist with a focus in lung cancer, I was surrounded by patients with terminal diagnoses. I felt like a failure for not finding joy in the new life I would meet so soon. I confided in my OB, or more accurately, I started crying in the middle of an appointment and then I had to confess. She sent me to a psychologist, Dr. D., I told no one but my husband, and I began having covert therapy appointments, intermittently each week, making vague excuses as I disappeared for an hour here or there. Dr. D led me out of a peripartum depression and left me with lifelong skills to cope with stress and loss. As I felt my life shifting back into focus, I began to wonder how you ever stop going to therapy. I received a call asking me to see a new patient with lung cancer with metastatic spread to the brain and to the bone. The fellow told me the patient was young and vibrant and needed a doctor like me. After telling me a summary of the patient, he told me her name. It was Dr. D. I had to tell the fellow why I could not take this patient. I had to ask a colleague to care for her. In both conversations, I spoke in hushed tones, naming her as my therapist, someone who could not be my patient. Both asked me if I was okay. And again, I said, I'm fine. I was not fine. I felt the approaching loss of someone I had come to depend on and care about. I felt the guilt for seeing her weekly and not noticing her symptoms. The colleague I asked to see this patient was one I'd known for a few years. We'd traded pleasant tales of adventures in parenting, and I knew her to be trustworthy. Yet I could not admit that I had sought help. I could not admit how Dr. D's diagnosis had impacted me. In recent years, I've become much more open about my struggles with peripartum depression. As a result, many have opened up to me with their similar struggles. Some suffered at the same time as I did, and yet we both struggled alone. We aren't supposed to mix our personal and work lives. We aren't supposed to show weakness as it may be a sign that we cannot be a great leader, clinician, oncologist, or researcher. Last fall, my father died unexpectedly. I returned to work a week later out of a sense of obligation and to fight back against the chaos I suddenly felt in my life. Work gives me structure. Previously, I'd been vague with supervisors about struggles, taking a sick day here or there when needs arose, then sitting in airports or waiting rooms, micromanaging the fallout of an unexpected day of work canceled. In this case, I sent a brief but honest email to the clinic stating, my father died suddenly, I'm out this week. All I received in reply was, we will take care of it. 
I heard nothing more and returned to work the following Monday. The clinic manager told me to leave. She told me to go to my office. She told me to do something else. At first, I was irate. I deemed myself ready to work. She firmly told me that I needed to leave. My patients had already been rescheduled to others in the clinic, and there was nothing left for me to do there. As I walked back to my office, I found myself grumbling about how I was a very strong person and that I was really ready to work. I was then surprised as I started to cry, and it was not subtle. I did not make it to my office before the big, messy cry that I told myself I really didn't need finally came pouring out. The clinic manager was right, and I was not ready that day. I was so thankful that I'd been honest enough to share my recent tragedy and that my colleagues had taken a strong hand in helping. I could not help but think, what if strength was admitting when we needed help? What if strength was allowing our colleagues to help us with the help we didn't know we needed? We have suddenly found ourselves in very strange times. A pandemic is surging around us, putting our patients at risk, stressing our healthcare systems, and at the same time robbing us of the face-to-face human connection so many of us need to maintain our mental health. The opportunities to reach out and bear witness to each other's struggles require a more conscious effort. It may take an extra phone call or a request for a mealtime Zoom. Then it takes the strength to answer, how are you, with something other than, I'm fine. Our next speaker is Dr. Kurt Edel. Dr. Edel graduated with a bachelor's degree in zoology from University of Wisconsin-Madison and received his MD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He completed his residency program in internal medicine at University of Vermont, followed by fellowship in medical oncology at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Edel holds an MBA from University of Massachusetts where he was the recipient of the Poet and Quants Award. He is the principal investigator for the Wisconsin Encore program, sits on the ECOG executive committee, and is the current chair of the ASCO State Affiliate Council. He presently works at Gunderson Health System, where he's on the board of medical governors and is the cancer center director. Dr. Edel's talk is entitled, Life Lessons from Worm Boy. I should not be here. Really, I shouldn't. And I shouldn't be talking to you. Yet, here I am. So where to start? You know, I think it all came to head in the fall of 86 during an uncomfortable meeting with an academic advisor just 10 weeks before graduation. It was my first and last. In my hand, I had an envelope which held my academic records. He looked at me and quickly sized me up like a prosecuting attorney. Without hesitation, he asked for its contents. I reluctantly gave him the evidence he was looking for, transcripts. His eyes went right to the bottom line, and looking up quietly, he said, GPA, 2.5. Huh. Pre-med, it says here. Yes, I muttered. MCATs, he asked. I pulled out the remaining papers, and this time his eyes got really big. And Without hesitation, he said, It appears, son, that you are in the 5% range. The bottom five? Yes, I muttered again. So, what's the backup plan, he asked. A hush fell over the room. The last two years flashed before my eyes. What my advisor did not know was that I had a plan, or at least I thought I had a plan. To compensate for my abysmal academic performance, I was trying to get practical experience. Got an EMT license. I worked at the cancer center as a ZCOG chart reviewer. And then, and then the worm job. See, to get research experience, I applied to Dr. Weiss's lab in the neurosciences department. His team was studying neurotransmitters using a worm which was chosen for its very simplistic 200 neuron system. And I remember standing there as Dr. Weiss told me about the job. My expectations were crushed. I would not be assisting in cutting edge research. Uh Uh-uh, nope. I was to be the collector of worms intestinal parasites from freshly killed hogs. Next day, I found myself driving each morning to a slaughterhouse where I spent several hours bent over a stainless steel table up to my elbows in warm hog intestines, searching for those precious worms. Funny thing is, 
<laughs> I was good at it. And so for the next two years, worm boy I became. Now, with graduation fast approaching and the words of my advisor still kind of swirling around in my head, I knew I needed that backup plan. I was discouraged by the lack of job prospects and knowing the worm job was going to another unsuspecting undergrad, I appealed to Dr. Weiss. He offered me hope in the form of a letter of recommendation and the contacts of some of his colleagues. One glitch. His colleagues were in the UK. Undaunted, I hastily wrote to all his contacts and after multiple rejection letters, I secured a job, Dr. Av Mitchinson's lab, doing tissue culture work in immunology. That was at University College, downtown London. Now, upon my return, I had a new focus, and I basically devoted the next five years of my life <laughs> making up for the first four. And I'd settle into a yearly routine. In the fall, I'd send applications, take grad classes, work at the lab, publish papers, and in the spring and summer, I'd receive rejection letters, retake MCATs, collapse, repeat. Occasionally, this ritual would be interrupted by an interview where I would actually meet some of the people who would send me the rejection letters. They're nice people and all. I would eventually get into medical school and go on to many other hurdles and challenges throughout my career. So all this leads me to here. And I ask myself, why am I here? What did those years teach me? Can someone else perhaps benefit from my experience? Well, let me start with this. In the words of John Maxwell, in life you will learn lessons. There are no mistakes, no mistakes, just lessons. A lesson is repeated until it's learned. And if you don't or can't learn the easy ones, they get harder, generally with more consequences. You know you've learned a lesson when your actions change. So, what lessons did I learn? Well, one of the first lessons I've learned, or perhaps better stated, realized, and over time, is the art of self-reflection. That is, the ability to look outside myself at myself. And I've come to the conclusion that by and large, we create our own lives. By fault or design, we generally place ourselves in the circumstances that shape our futures. Now we strive for success, and by doing so, we invariably need to overcome obstacles along the way. For myself, that biggest obstacle is me. Yes, I've met the enemy, and it is I. Secondly, I learned that it's not about the product, it's not about the end, as stated by Brene Brown in her book, Rising Strong. It's about the messy middle. That's where the magic happens. It's that process, the sifting and winnowing, the late nights, the early mornings, that endless repetition of getting it right, of getting it right. The endless work of never letting sight of the goal, no matter what. And in that messy middle, I've discovered it's also about the people, the people that touch our lives when we are most vulnerable, either overtly or by accident. They make our goals possible. Formally, we call them mentors. Casually, we call them friends. But by whatever title, they are godsends, and we should not forget that. I wish for everyone who is listening to this that you should be as fortunate to have mentors such as I've had. Thank you, Dr. Paul Sandel. Third, I've learned that opportunity doesn't always look like opportunity. In life, we hold perceptions, and in each one of our perceptions lies our reality. It's where we have reference and judge and surmise the decisions we make. It can be narrow or broad. In my own reality at the time, it was narrow. I never connected a lowly worm job with an opportunity for international travel, leading to work that can actually make a meaningful difference. That experience reinforced the need to always give of oneself above and beyond, no matter the perceived reward or lack thereof. One can never know where such endeavors end. It also reinforced my belief then and now that I really am above nothing. No job is beneath me. I hope it's not for you either. Finally, I'd like to close with gratitude. The road to where I am has been tumultuous, delayed, and full of detours. It's not what I envisioned when I embarked upon this journey. However, if it weren't for where I've been, I wouldn't be where I am. I'm so grateful for my family, friends, and colleagues who have encouraged and supported and traveled with me. 
I really, really wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. And as I close, I'm reminded of the words from poet Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Our final speaker in the session is Dr. Onyema Okolo. Dr. Okolo was born in Lagos, Nigeria, and moved to the United States with her family at the age of eight. She did her undergraduate work at Johns Hopkins University and medical school at St. George's University, dividing her time between Granada and New York City. She is currently completing dual fellowship training in hematology and oncology at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, where she serves as a chief fellow, and in integrative medicine, where she is a fellow at the University of Arizona Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Her talk is entitled, 2% times two. Hello everybody. My name is Onyema Okolo. I am a senior hematology and medical oncology fellow. I want to invite you into a fictionalized patient encounter with me. A bit of a one woman show, if you will. At some point, we all find ourselves in a less than comfortable situation and we can't often choose these encounters. What we can choose though, is how we handle them. Mr. Smith, we've discussed a lot today and I know it can be overwhelming and a lot to digest, but I am going to be here to walk the path with you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to take care of you. Do you have any questions for me? Hmm, well, not really, but when am I going to see the doctor? Hmm. Imagine the composure it takes to not have a reaction, not even a raised eyebrow. This is an all too common question for me that I feel I've become somewhat at a pro at answering. But before I answer, I do a quick mental questionnaire. Number one, did I introduce myself? Yes, I definitely did. Number two, does my name tag say doctor? Yep, that's still here and it's not faded. Number three, am I wearing my white coat? Mm-hmm, and it's fresh from the dry cleaners, bright white. Number four, did I just spend almost an hour reviewing diagnosis, images, pathology reports, health and lifestyle changes, and answering questions along the way? Yep, pretty sure that was me and we didn't just sit here in silence. I shift a little in my chair and respond. Mr. Smith, I am the doctor. The reaction from the patient is usually interesting for me. There's a pause, shifting in their chair, a blush, maybe embarrassment, but always wide-eyed. They are reevaluating the scene. Oh, I see it now, they think to themselves. Some remain confused without their politically correct filter. Really? But you're a black, I mean, hmm. You're a black woman, isn't that something? Others say almost patronizingly, good for you, or how modern, even, that's something you don't see every day. They're right though, it's not something you see every day. As a black woman, I belong to a demographic that is only 2% of practicing doctors in the US. And of the 20,000 practicing oncologists, just 2.5% self-identify as black or African-American. I don't even know how many in that 2.5% are women. Others appear excited saying, I've never had a doctor that looks like me. One said to me, you are my ancestors' wildest dreams. My heart swelled. Though rarely, the patient never returns for their follow-up appointment with me. Sometimes they flat out ask for a different doctor. I can guess why, but that's okay too. Once in a while, I ruminate on encounters like this replaying the patient's reaction, trying to see myself how they see me, 
both before and after realization that this five foot four black woman is their doctor, their oncologist. It's interesting to me. Does it bother me? To be honest, I love both reactions. Clearly one makes me feel happy and warm and the other not so much, but both drive me. These encounters are opportunities to educate, to break stereotypes, to say, see me, I am here. So I say to him, Mr. Smith, I am your doctor. Do you have any other questions? He looks at me and says, no doc. Like you said, it's a lot to digest, but I'm ready. There is no greater teacher than an example that already exists. When a child is choosing their path and is full of excitement for the possibilities ahead, seeing an example of what is possible creates the opportunity in their mind. The same thing is true for patients. It is essential for our worldwide community and culture to have examples of what is possible for all backgrounds and use that example to drive possibilities. I wake up every day and I'm thankful that I'm reminded of my blackness. I am proud to occupy that 2% space and to be a part of the example and inspiration for others to hopefully follow suit. Thank you.